I'll start recording now. I guess I'll just get started. So I haven't been streaming in a really long time. Um, gosh, how long ago? I guess I did a quick stream when Shenzhen IO came out, but before then, I think the last real programming stream I did was probably like June last year. So it's been a real long time. Um, before I get into the programming, uh, since this will be posted on my channel as well, where people have probably wondered what I've been up to and whether I'll resume streaming, uh, I guess for those who don't follow my Twitter account, um, I'll just kind of summarize. So uh, some of you may know that I've been working at Oculus uh, as an engineering lead for a number of years, I guess two and a half, almost three years now, and uh, been um, been very busy, obviously. Uh, I worked on a team where we shipped some some demo experiences, uh, one called one that shipped a Stream Deck, which is sort of the main experience that you saw when you launched the Rift and installed it for the first time, and also a game that uh, shipped with the Rift called Farland. So I was the engineering lead on that team. Um, and in the last six months, I was doing something else uh, on another team, building a new team from scratch, doing kind of systems engineering. Um, but uh, after our Christmas holidays, me and my wife decided uh, that basically we, we would take a break. So, uh, uh, you know, going to resign and we'll formally leave Oculus end of April. And uh, planning on moving back to Thailand where I used to live with my wife. And so the immediate plan is to spend at least two to three years um, basically uh, taking a break. Uh, I'll be working on my own projects, purely personal projects, not for profit, just for my own edification and hopefully um, for, for the benefit of others as well. And I'll talk more about that in the future about my plans. But um, so that's sort of where I am. And uh, the reason I haven't been streaming for the last, I guess, nine months is basically other stuff got caught up in. And um, but I'm hoping to get back to it. But uh, right now we're in the midst of getting ready for a move to Thailand. And so expect streaming to resume, assuming our internet is OK, uh, probably middle of May, end of May. So uh, that's just some quick background. All right, so um, I, I have really big plans for uh, for stuff I'm going to work on once I uh, once I'm finally done with my my job and I can start working on that stuff. But um, in the meantime, maybe from now until I move, I thought I would just shake the rust off and get back into some smaller scale projects, and uh, then later on, uh, I'll maybe announce the big thing I want to work on and. Fortunately, the the project. Well, fortunately for people who've been waiting for more streams and been asking me to do more streams, the project will involve a bunch of sort of public, uh, well, certainly some streaming and probably also more formal uh, videos and, and articles and stuff like that. Because I know that um, you know one one consistent piece of feedback is that, and I knew this. This was sort of part of the format, but it's a little bit ad hoc. It's not very structured, and it can be hard for people to sort of get up to speed on what's going on and a lot of people don't have time to watch hours and hours of someone streaming which is totally understandable so kind of my, my broad strokes plan for doing that stuff is you know doing a bunch of streaming live both to keep myself inter uh, sort of engaged and uh, ensure forward progress and also for people who kind of want to follow along live but then maybe on a weekly basis do you know kind of extract some of the useful pieces into articles or more focused uh, kind of edited videos so people who don't have time to just waste away their evenings watching me hack away can uh, can get something out of it too. Uh, it will also force me to think through things a little bit more than I did previously. My, my old approach was just to sort of sit down when I felt bored and do some programming. And I'll still do that, but I'll also do something to sort of package package up what I'm doing and you know hopefully release some actual code that people can look at that's more tied up uh, in it with the neat bow and uh, also some articles and some more educational material. So anyway, a bunch of plans along those lines. All right. So um, one thing I wanted to start working on for fun um, is a project that I don't know, for lack of a better word, I'm, I'm going to call it Pixie. I'm going to start completely from scratch as usual. Um, and Basically, it's intended to be a sort of old school integrated development environment um, 
for developing kind of retro style games. So definitely, it's very much like Pico 8, but it's intended to be a completely self-contained implementation of those ideas. I guess partly because um, I grew up with those sort of integrated game development environments. Um, I had a an Amiga that was sort of the two computers I had as a kid that uh, were formative for me were the Commodore 64 um, and the Amiga 500. And the Amiga 500 had a bunch of uh, a bunch of sort of game development tools that were these sort of integrated packages. And, and one that stands out was uh, Amos. Um, I have some videos here, but. Um, a lot of these had like some sort of basic derived scripting language. And uh, they usually had, in the case of Amos, they definitely had like sprite editors and animation editors and sound editors. Yeah, so I think this was Amos. Uh, like, yeah, they had sprite editors and all this other stuff. So it's very much in the vein, like if if the first thing you've seen in this vein is Pico 8, it's sort of like, I guess, the predecessor of, of, of that sort of tool where you have everything very tightly integrated and unlike something like Unity, which is sort of, I guess, the very modern, uh, extremely fully featured version of this idea, one of the uh, great sources of appeal of the older systems was that um, back then, I guess, more for technical constraint reasons than any kind of design reason, but they were more uh, constrained. And so it was much easier for people to just kind of jump in and do stuff. Um, whereas, you know, Unity and Unreal and those things, those are great tools, but there's a lot of complexity there. And so I thought I would see basically how, if I could make a tool like that um, with its own scripting language, you know, every, using nothing external, like Pico8 uses Lua, we're going to do our own scripting language, a very small one, you know, uh, built-in art editor, music tracker, map editor, uh, stuff like that. So it's quite a lot of pieces, but I think by keeping things very focused and compact, um, we can keep it manageable and we'll see how far we'll get. Um, but I thought tonight I would start uh, the scripting language, uh, which should be pretty, pretty, pretty quick to knock out if we keep it simple. All right. So I guess I'll just start programming. Nope, definitely not class wizard. I'm surprised that thing still exists. All right. Um, Is the screen is the screen readable here? I think I haven't really set up my font size. Uh, there's already another handmade thing on Pixie. All right, maybe I'll, I'll change my name later. Um, assuming that thing. Oh, it's actually even a. Not, let me just look at this URL. If it's literally another uh, retro game system, then you know I'm going to have to restart this project. Ah. Uh, okay, that's definitely close to what I had in mind. That sucks. That's a, I thought it was a good name. It's like apparently someone else thought it was a good name too. All right. Well, rest in peace, Pixie. Um, th that wasn't very long lasted, was it? All right. Now we have to think of a new name. Names are important. Uh, all right. Think fast. Think fast. Um, okay. Just give me a second here. Uh, okay, how about, yeah, oh no, I, I wonder if anyone gets this reference. Oh, I already created something called Ono. Oh I have a bunch of these backup names, I'm just going to delete the old one because this was just a uh, 
and scratch project. This is my new laptop, so I don't really have any real code on here. Um, okay. Okay, names, names, names. Go on. So, so does anyone have... Uh, Yeah, new name. All right. Anyone have name ideas? I'll entertain name ideas and I'll think for a sec. I would feel bad about starting a Visual Studio project with a name I'll have to change for some reason. That's just uh, how my brain works. So I, I want to have at least something that serves as a placeholder if nothing else. I could just go and delete the other one. No, it's literally just. All right. Um, I'll call it deck. How about that? For no particular reason. The 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 Ono reference was a. Uh, it's like a neuromancer, neuromancer reference. There's the is it Ono Sendai cyber deck. Yeah, it's like a. Cyberdeck console. All right, so let's just go with that. All right. Um, yeah, so that's scripting language. Um, let me create. Um, Okay, so what do we what do we want in this language? So I was thinking uh, we'll do a really simple language uh, with um, numbers, strings, and tables, much like Lua. Actually, let's just do list as separate. I don't think I want to take the Lua approach there. Um, you know, f functions, no closures, um, dynamically typed. Um, um, what kind of syntax, uh, normal, arithmetic, logical operators, um, yeah, let's see. Hmm. Let's just say curly braces to make it easy and semicolons. Um, um, statements are uh, procedure calls. And uh, assignments return. Um, if while for something like that. All right. And to keep it simple, I think we're just going to parse directly from string. Um, and going to have some tokens. Let's see here. Uh, 
guess we can just do it this way. If it's a digit. God. Okay. So for identifiers, um, I guess we'll find the start. Um, all right, so we passed all of this and so we have a non alphanumeric character and then um, All right, so this is some sort of interning table where the idea is we return a string and we get back the canonical representative of that string. So if you know if, if you have two identifiers equal to the same string value, you know for example if, then we will always bet the, get back the same value um, by interning things in a table, and that way we can do pointer comparisons. So let's just do a linear table for now. Um, let's call it symbols. Actually, let's just make it statically sized for now. We can change that later. So, um, so we're going to make this really dumb to start with. Actually, we can't do that, I suppose. Um, let's see. Well, okay. So, as long as these are not exhausted and they match, so I think what we want to check is that the loop exited because both of them were exhausted.
this happens when there was a match. Otherwise, we have to create a new entry. Um, plus one because we need a null terminator. Um, and then we copy from start and start well. Let's jump down here. Top. Sorry for now. There's really nothing interesting going on. If, if if anything interesting happens, I'll start talking and explaining more. Um, I guess we need standard lib and string. Let's just save this many for now. Yeah, no, no, you notice that I left out the new symbol. Yeah, that's dumb oversight. Um, all right, let's just read this again from the top. So we get in a string interval from two pointers. Uh, we go through the symbol table. We walk these two in lockstep and make sure they match. Or rather, we keep we keep stepping them in parallel as long as neither of them are exhausted and the corresponding characters match. And then when we're done, we want to make sure that the reason we're done is not because of a mismatch, but because um, but because we exhausted them. All right. Um, and then if there isn't a match, check to make sure we're not. I'm going to run out of space. I also have to run symbols. Oh, I have to insert it into the table. So, run symbols, new symbol. Let's see. All right. All right. Um, okay, I have to go and change. It's doing auto indentation for me, but it's using a weird layout convention that is not how I normally do it. So I really have to go and uh, fix that before it drives me crazy. One second. Um. Nope.
don't think this is swear. Oh, here we go. Uh, keep on the same line. And let's see if that's better. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so I'm going to use a trick that I think I explained in my compiler stream, but um, for token encodings, we are going to essentially use literals literal representation for uh, single character tokens and then which is sort of using the lower seven bits right and so uh, things that are not of that sort will start higher here i'm using an int so it could start even higher but uh, i'm just going to use that and so what were the just some examples here uh Right, so for these, we are going to simply set the thing to itself. Um, unknown. Okay, let me just go and expand this thing to uh, be variatic. Um, okay, let me just go and look at the signature for that thing. I'm just going to make it static for now, uh, just to keep things moving. Buffer, size of buffer. Um, is this maybe should be error F. Um, so format and then arcs. This should be like VA start format. Just up as well. Right, VA start args format. Um, to end. I guess this is standard IO, just plain standard IO.
All right, let me just see what chat is saying. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Token duplicator. Oh, you're right, I put that up here. All right, let's see. Um, just read this. All right, we're also going to treat the null terminator. Um, so basically the null terminator becomes the null token. And so this is a way we can see the end of the stream when we're parsing. Um, I think I'm just going to start this way. This is not super efficient. I think if you saw my other stream, when I did the uh, my, my Lexer, I had a single switch um, so that there was not a lot of unnecessary control flow. Um, but I don't want to type out, you know, a through C and zero through 10. I mean, so zero through 10 is doable, but A through C, both upper and lower case is gonna drive me crazy. So uh, we're not gonna do that for now. All right, um, let's just do a simple test here. I don't like that code word. Um, what's a good word for that? Input is too generic. Maybe I'll just call it stream. And this will be, oh, that's even more generic. Oh, let's just leave it at code for now. So I think it's something I like more. All right, so, um, Okay, let's try that. Didn't crash. Let me just. Okay, it's already at the end. That is. Oh, we haven't done this night. So let's see here. Why is it not showing? Oh, I guess they're all in the globals. It's a little bit weird. But. Okay, I'm not incrementing. Okay, so end is where I expect it to be. No match because it's the whole thing is empty. Size is nine. Hello, one, two, three. Hello is five plus three, eight, and then one for the null terminator. That's correct. Get back this buffer, copy it over, null terminate it, insert it into the table. And this thing should now be one. Now our token identifier is the right thing. Um, 
should also do this. In case you guys don't know about this trick, the, 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 the debugger watch window expression stuff has this directive where you can do commas. And so in this case, comma C means also display it as a you know ASCII character. So that looks right. Okay, got another one that we should be done. We are. So that looks good. So the next thing I would try is um, put in another of these and then another hello one, two, three, because the, the second hello one, two, three should resolve to the same po pointer as the original because of the interning. So, I mean, let me, let me just get out some of this other junk since it's just in the way. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so let's see here. CC83EO. So this is ASDF. Um, this was the minus. So I want to see, was it CC something something EO? Was it 83? Let me just. So this was six, F64 E00. F64 E00. All right. So that looks good. Then I want to check with some variable amount of white space. All right, looks reasonable. Um, there's some other, let's just finish with at least the stuff we listed. Um, so there's these three. Uh, I think we put this one under the single character bucket. Equals is a little bit weird because depending on whether it's followed by another equals, we have to treat it as a uh, you know an assignment or or not. So uh, what we will do is we will say if the next one is also an equals, um, well, actually, I guess we can do it like this. No, let's do it like that. Yeah. Okay, so we increment it, and then we check the thing after it. And if it's this, then... token assign or token equals um, else token and if we do that we also have to increment it uh, otherwise it's just plain old single equals um, boom, boom, boom. all right now let's do reserved words um, so one thing, one shortcut I'm going to take is instead of doing special parsing for the built-in keywords, I'm just going to intern them and then do pointer comparisons. So that's a little bit easier. So um, uh, all right.
Yeah, so what I'm doing, I'm, I'm not going. I'm, I'm trying to get back into the swing of things. Sorry if I'm not talking too much. Uh, it takes a while for me to get back into that habit of talking and programming it the same way. Right now, I'm just doing the tokenizer. My plan is to do a really, really simple scripting language that I can completely finish in the next couple of hours, at least for the basic feature set. So I'm going to be going pretty fast. And that involves both the lexer, the parser, uh, the code generator, and the bytecode interpreter. So I'm going to try to keep it simple, but I want to support the basic stuff I listed here probably within the next few hours. So let's see how far we can get. Um, all right, let's see if this thing works. All right, let's see if this works. Yep. All right. I'm satisfied that works. So anyway, the idea now is, um, actually I'll move this higher up so they're in scope of the symbol table stuff here. Um, let's just go initialize. So the idea now is um, after we have found an identifier here, um, we're essentially going to do just do some some checks. So if uh, we do, and we can do a pointer. Oops, we can do a pointer compare because everything is interned. Um, okay, I don't know why I'm doing a return. It should be an assignment. So have we now put in some some ifs for a while at the front? Um, let's see what we get. Got. It. I'm going to make these enums because otherwise I can't see shit in the debugger. Yeah, and I was complaining about that. We will just shut it up. So that's a while. That's a four. Now we have an identifier. A forty-three. Um, uh, minus. All right, that looks reasonable. Someone's asking why I'm writing a parser by hand. Writing parsers by hand is faster than using Antler, um, in my opinion and experience. Having written, uh, I don't know how many parsers I've written in my life, but I've written probably hundreds or at least a hundred, let's say. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not any faster and you end up having to deal with the tool chain and so on. If you're dealing with languages that require um, parsing techniques that are not easy to do by hand, sure. But in this case, we're going to make our own language. It's going to be very easy to parse. Um, so we won't really be able to reap any gains from third-party tools like that. Um, all right, I think that's probably it for the Lexer. So uh, let's start by doing a very simple, um, where to start? Should we do the parser or should we do the yeah, let's do the parser. So let's start with the expression parser, which is probably the trickiest, well, not very tricky, but trickiest part. And uh, I'm just going to assume normal operator precedents. And probably I'll get some of these wrong, but let's start with plus minus times equals. 
Um, so uh, these have to be left associative. So we use the standard trick of saying while um, So I guess let me write down the BNF for this. Um, something like that, right? So we do this, and then we do this, and then there is a follow-up expression. And the idea behind the semantics of these is these will emit bytecode. Right now, we're just going to parse without doing anything, but uh, these will eventually, as a side effect, emit bytecode to the code stream, which we haven't set up yet. Um, so this, and you know, let, let's just sc scaffold it at least. Um, or emit add, emit sub. Something like that. And then this thing is going to sort of do the equivalent, but for um, um, but for these higher precedence ones, Because it also includes this one. Might as well put that in while we're at it. And then for now, let's just say this is the terminal level. And so um, if we're dealing with a number, um, Um, oh, yeah, we haven't done parentheses. Let's do those. Um, if we have an open paren, then we essentially just... Um, Let's write a little helper, helper here. Um, let me. Yeah, I don't know. This is brittle, but if we use it carefully, it won't be a problem. Um, I guess the other way to do it would be to have a big buffer with all the characters pre put in there. Uh, let's just do this. Now, um, let's make this something that puts it into a buffer instead. It's uh, the best way to do this to stringify it. Because if it's a number, I want to print the number. Yeah, okay. Let me just do the 
static buffer trick, but do it a little bit better here. Um, so this is one path. And there's the others. And uh, I don't know. So this is something like this. Um, else of t is token number. Let's do a burn buff at the end. If it's a number, um, so we just return it actually like that. Um, and I guess that doesn't, you know what, I'm just going, this also works better with the whole idea. It only operates on the current token. It also sort of makes it more obvious that this buffer is transient. So let's move this down here. <clears throat> Else if token is token identifier. I'm just going to do it the same way, even though this feels a little bit dirty, or not dirty, but using the same pattern for all of these. So we need this for if and loan for. Wasn't it? Where was it? All right, expected. So the thing we wanted to do now is to say, um, no, that's God, that's annoying. I can't. No, that's. I guess that's true. Expected. Hmm, this technique won't work for I do I do actually need something I can do this to. And I can't get back the specific value. Okay, let's just punt on that. I don't want to deal with it. Um, I'll just write them literally as an integers for now. Oh, that's so annoying. It's because it's C plus plus. I think they won't allow those. Yeah, and this one. All right, let's just, let's just kill it for now. All right, so where were we? Uh, we wrote this expect function, which is convenient. But we're going to need that a bunch of places. All right, so open paren, consume it, uh, expression, close paren. So we want this to consume the token too. Let's call expect token.
Um, does that work? Right. So that handles this. We have to consume the token, of course. We have to consume that one too. Um, Let me just read this from the top. Oh yeah, let me also write the BNF out. So number or identifier or expression. Let's also do negation. I think it needs to live at the same level. Um, in this case, I think this is the right precedence for it to bind tightly. Because if you have something like um what's an example minus two times three you obviously don't want the minus to apply to this whole expression you want it to only apply to the two so it binds very tightly so that looks right All right, yeah, to write this up too. All right, um, let me just make sure this does something roughly in the ballpark. Uh, I should create a function to Um, what's what should be? I guess you can call it initialize. Yeah, let's just leave it like this for now. So let's start with something simple, like a a uh, a simple number. Where did I go? All oh, right, so it's skipping over this, and the current token is now zero, so we're actually done. So all of this stuff should skip out. So that was right. Um, let's do the same with a symbol. Correct. Now let's try. Something like this, one plus two. Um, so first it should go up to exp two and consume that, that's correct. And now it goes out to this level and none of these look ahead tokens should match. Now it goes here and it finds the plus Okay, and that gapped, I am unfortunately. Oh, I didn't mean to break out. Let's try that again. So the token is, right. So we have the hop is 43, which is the plus. And then we descend into here. And our code is currently the two, so we expect that to hit this. Oh, it doesn't. It didn't consume the plus, that's the problem. So 
Let's just verify we fixed the same bug. Okay. So that has. All right, that works. Let's do something like this. Just to make sure the president is right. So this should go down to X2, consume the number one. And now it should see the next one is times. Yep. And skip over that. Now there's a two, and it should go up and consume that, which it does. And now it's not going to find another of that precedence. So it goes up one level, but it should find a plus, which it does. And finds the three. All right. So that's all good. Um, so I'm pretty convinced this is sort of working for the basics. Let's do a really simple bytecode VM that just does these operations, just as a stepping stone to more stuff. Um, so we're going to have a push op code to push constants, add sub malt. Div and mod. I think those are the only things we have implemented right now. It's going to be upcodes. And Hmm. Okay, let's just have a static buffer for now. This data to be super generic. Let's do unaligned stuff. All right, so I think this looks reasonable. I think now for the code emitter, all we have to do is emit the constant. We're still not doing identifiers. We can skip that for now. Um, we also need negation. Yeah, I guess this leave them. So this will push the result and then we negate it and then okay, 
that's this garbage. What is it complaining about? Oh. All right. Um, so let's see if it does that correctly. Actually, let's write the bytecode interpreter for this while we're at it. So, so, so it'll be easier to test. Um, this is called step. Um, this is terrible names. So let's write something else. Still have returned just as we have. Okay, so execute. Let's say what this does is while um, up is whatever is exec pointer. And um, if this, um, if this is ret, then we return the the um, I guess the top of the stack. Um, now let's not do an if, let's do a switch. Let's just bring them all here so make sure we don't forget about them. So for a push, Let's step past that. Um, for the push, we need to um, Okay, this is way too much to type. Let me uh, call it SP for stack pointer. I will call this IP for instruction pointer. I don't want to initialize them there. All right, so this is the IP. Um, all right, then for add, um, the stack will net decrease. So I think you want to do this. Let's see sub 
more div mod neck sub more div mod neg. So sub is this, is that. And neg is just going to, um, I guess, no net change in the stack. And the final one was ret. I'm going to treat that as returning what's on top of the stack. <clears throat> All righty. Um, before we put these two things together, I'm going to test just the bytecode interpreter with some uh, manually initialized code. Um, so if I emit a push and a one, then another push and a two, and then an add, uh, and then a ret. And then I set the to the start of the emit buffer and SP to so execute stack. Terrible name. I have to rethink some of these names. All right, what was that function called? Execute. Let's see how that goes. Up is zero, which is push. Let's look at the stack. Um, no, sorry, not. All right, so that did push a one. Let's make this the stack pointer so we can see where that goes. So that is a one on the stack. There's another push, now there's a two. Now there's a three and SP is back. The pointing there. And now that is a three, all right. Looks reasonable. So if exception thrown, all right, what did I fail to initialize here? Actually, let's step through this code first, through the emit stuff. So first I should go up here. Okay, not doing this right. Yep. Now it should pick up that look ahead. So now we should pick up the three down here. Okay, so we didn't do those yet. The 
let's say, let's pretend that works. Okay, so that's the division by zero. That sounds like, I mean, first off, there shouldn't be a mod. Okay, so that's a bug. This shouldn't be a mod anywhere in this code. Um, I guess let's see what actually executed. So the first should be a push. It's because we don't have a ret, I believe. Um, for now, I guess, let's just emit a ret manually. Five. That is the correct answer. All right, we're done. So that's it for basically the expression, the basic expression logic. Uh, maybe I'll take a quick pause in case people aren't following. Everything here is like, I think the most standard textbook way of doing things with a stack based VM. But uh, let's see what people are saying so far. Order of ops is right. Um, I mean, I should I should obviously check more presidents if that's what you're saying. So if we do this, we should get uh, yeah five as well. You can test that. Yep. Um, I mean, if it seems like I banged this out quickly, especially for the expression parser, it's because there is a textbook way of doing handwritten expression parsing with left associativity. Actually, the more interesting one for left associativity is doing something like this. Um, you know, let's try this. So this should be minus two, I guess, right? Yep. So, um, the way some people are taught to write recursive descent parsers tends to work best with uh, right associativity. So for example, let me show you the wrong way of doing it, just for illustration. Suppose I had written uh, this, and then um, like this. Um, so not even a while, just an if and then a recursion onto the same function that's doing this. What would happen is, uh, well, for plus it's fine. So so I guess a better illustration would be minus. This is going to be right associative. So if it sees one minus two minus three, it's going to interpret it as uh, like this, which is not the right answer. This would be uh, plus two, right? Because this is one minus minus one. Um, and so, yeah, like in functional languages, for example, you often see people writing things in this right, right recursive way, which works great for right associative uh, operators. But for left associative, you need to do this kind of left folding where you do a look ahead and then you kind of spin in a loop rather than doing this right recursion. So anyway, um, I went into detail about this in my other compiler stream. I'm, I'm doing it in a more tight way here because we're not doing so complicated stuff. All right, um, boom, boom, boom. Oh, my test case doesn't actually check the order of ops. So my original, oh, I see what you mean, because I'm multiplying by one. I guess an interesting one would be something like this. Uh, that's not the right thing. Let's see what this should be. One plus 
six. Um, yeah, 11, that's the right answer for this one. I'm not going to exhaustively test the parser right now, uh, even though if I was being careful, I would. Um, unless I made typos, I'm fairly, I, I mean, I kind of am familiar with this parsing structure. So and if they're small bugs, we'll find them later. All right. Um, so this will do the right thing. Let's do, all right, so what about statements? Um, boom, boom, boom. So a statement can be, hmm, what did we say? A statement can be, I guess, an assignment. Or it can be if expression. Okay, so let's see if we have the notion of statement list. Mm, anyway, brain fart, let's see what we want to do. Assignments, if, um, probably something like statement block. Just trying to remember a good name for that. Um, then optional else statement block and one or more of these. I guess let's just do while. Um, so yeah, let's not do function calls until we actually have more infrastructure for supporting those. Let's just do these. We can probably do these right now with a little bit of work. Um, all right, so I think the idea in the execution engine is that we're going to have some sort of frame pointer, which will point to local variable slots. And then we're going to have get and set bytecodes. Go move these up to be with push. And for this one, we are going to, and here we're just going to read a single byte. So it's just going to be this. We're not. So it pushes. I guess calling it push is now a bad name. Let's call it uh, const. Oh, interesting. Um, 
It's called literal. Uh, that's funny. All right. Um, so I think you do something roughly like this. You push something on the stack from the frame pointer and you increment that. And then for the set, you um, sort of do this instead. So what this does is it takes the top thing on the stack and shoves it into the designated slot relative to the frame pointer. Um, so let's write some let's write some test code for that. Just emitting bytecode directly. Um, so let's say we have a frame here. I don't like this little execute stack. Go away. Let's use our local stack here. Same with the emit buffer. Shouldn't be a thing. Okay, so set this here, set this here, set this here. And then let's emit, well, emit pointer, set that to emit buffer. Let's put this down here. And then let's emit some code. Um, so emit a literal, and then um, emit a set to slot zero, and then a ret, and let's see how it goes. Let's see here. Literal. Oh. Um, frame stack. All right, let's just see what happens. So the first should be this. And I think if we. Uh, that's not global, that's annoying. Uh, I guess I can just use frame pointer here. Okay, so that is correct. is not correct. Oh, after set, I don't increment it correctly. All right. One, two, three. Stack is now back to point.
you know, that, well, that is kind of right because there's nothing on the stack. So what I should then do, maybe, is to put something else on the stack like 4403 and, um, and then get slot zero and then add them and then return that. So push that on the stack, uh, one, two, three, and slot zero. Um, push another thing on the stack. Right, so now that new literal is on the stack, and now we push one, two, three, which was the previous, well, the contents of that slot. And now, okay, is that right? I thought for some reason it was going to be a different number. Let's see, four, five, six, so it should be, nine all right i guess that is correct all right that seems pretty reasonable i guess let's just leave this for now <clears throat> So then the main, so, so just to recap, we now have this notion of a frame, which is indexed by an integer. You can generate these get and set byte codes to manipulate it. Um, now our job in the parser is essentially to map variable names to, you know, like local variables to, um, to slots. Um, and for that, we need some sort of environment. We're actually let me do something really lazy that won't scale, but is convenient for now, which is I'm just going to um, say the slot is the token identifier minus uh, symbols. So the first symbol will have slot zero and so on. So the allocation order in the symbol table becomes the index, which you know is more like it's not the greatest. Um, why is this? Uh, Okay, where were we? Um, so token identifier is a constructor that whatever. Oh. Now that doesn't, okay, now that doesn't work because the allocation is not, I would need to know where it is. Well, I guess we can kind of do that. Um, now let's just do a proper data structure. Um, so let's say
get variable. Um, Actually, let's just use a table. Um, Let's see if this makes sense. So we uh, we look this up. Let's find the slot. So this would be zero for the first. It's never going to be zero actually because the keywords are going to take those slots. But it's going to be some number, and then skip it, emit a get for that. All right. And then on the statement, um, this is a little bit annoying in terms of look ahead to treat this as a okay I'm trying to remember what presidents we should use for this okay let's just do it here um I'm not sure this presidents will work, but this is definitely convenient in terms of the code structure. If I do this, um, what let's just do. Legal and escape sequence. Let's have to think of this for now. Actually, let let, let us do this. Um, what we will do is we will say parse an expression we'll use these terminators or uh, separators instead of terminators I guess um, 
all the next token is equal to that. Uh, skip that. Emit a pop, so that's something we need as well. It's really just decrementing this so we can get rid of temporary expression values. In these sorts of void contexts. Um, so skip that token, emit a void to suppress the thing from here and do another one. And then finally, emit ret. I guess this is not really a statement. Um, this is called as a block. OK, so expression. And then if there's a separator, then we go for another. All right. So in theory, this should now work without the manual emit ret. Let's just test this thing so it works. All right. Um, all right, so that still works. Um, now, let's make it more interesting by saying x equals 42. Let's first see if that parses at all. So we get variables 3, which makes sense because it's the first non-keyword identifier, and we get um, this one, which should become a number. And then we emit a set to that three. And now we're done. I think one problem with this is if we're treating it as an expression, um, okay, so we're going to do a dirty trick because if we're using this as an expression, we have to make sure we leave something on the stack, um, but this set consumes the previous thing. So we were just going to read it, reset it, and then read it back out. So I think this is sort of a way of doing that. And so um, if we execute that, we should just get 42. We do. Let's check our frame here. Yeah, and so 42 is in the right slot. And now we should be able to say um, y equals 1 plus 3, um, and then x plus y. Unexpected initial token semicolon. All right, let's step through that. By the way, this I'm just catch up on what. Um, who is writing stuff? Um, yeah, so name guy 101 is this is cool because you can run the same bytecode on different stacks frames. Did you intentionally give it that sort of sandboxing potential? I don't know if I thought about it in terms of sandboxing, but it's definitely convenient just to factor it out like this. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to note is, um, you know, th there's this eternal debate between people who use step debugging like I do. I use it more aggressively than anyone I know. You, I think you can see that I constantly rerun from a given position using control 10. Control F10 to restart it when I have these isolated test cases. And especially for stuff like this, it is so much easier. Like I, I've 
I, I used to write parsers before I became a, an aficionado of SEP debugging and tracing through this kind of recursive code with a lot of decision logic, it's basically a nightmare. You need a lot of print statements. You're constantly adding and removing print statements based on circumstance. Just being able to step st through stuff and instantly rerun stuff and all this, you know, is so much easier. So anyway, just side rant. Hopefully that's really evident. I know I'm not explaining all my kind of debugging thinking, but it's so easy to just debug this stuff and debug it as you write it rather than um, setting up these enormous test harnesses or whatever to help you isolate bugs. All right, um, so this had a problem with the semicolon, so let's see what that problem was. Okay, so it's almost like it consumed the semicolon at the wrong position. Um, oh, the problem is we don't actually recognize it. That would do it, wouldn't it? Okay, so moment of truth. Um, we first have a little roll. And we then have a set to put it in the right stack frame. So that's now there. And then we're actually going, going to read it again because we need to make sure it's still on the stack. Yep. And then the next one is pop, which I think is correct. Yep. Because we're doing multiple statements and we don't want to leave any excess crap on the stack. And then the next one is another literal. Let me just go and read the statement so I can remember, or the expression so I can remember. So this is, okay, so this is one plus three. So it could be a three now, and then an add. And then it's going to set this to, yep, slot four and then get the value from slot four, and then pop it <laughs> because we're using a dumb compiler. And now um, it's going to, what was it? X plus, yeah, so it should be 40, yep. So it's get the value of two things and then do an add. And then finally, a return. So 44 plus 4 is 46, so that's correct. So that all worked. So how long did that take? I think that took an hour. Or did it take two hours? When did I start streaming? Okay, it says two hours, so that's longer than I thought. Um, but anyway, you can see that, so what do we have now? I mean, some of this stuff is very makeshift and should be kind of cleaned up, but, you know, we have full expression parsing um, with kind of global variables and uh, a stack VM and stuff like that. So it's not too bad for a few hours of work. Um, and 300 lines of code or so. All right, let's see. Um, let's do functions, I think. That's the first interesting thing. So how do you do functions? Let's see. Oh, let's do if and while. We haven't done control flow. That's definitely more important. Let's do control flow. That illustrates some interesting principles as well. Um, All right, let's see here.
Um, okay, so if we have an if, then the next thing is an expression, and then we're going to expect a curly brace. Um, and then as while token and token is not a final brace, we consume a statement. I didn't expect this. Um, consume the statement, look for a curly block. Look for. Okay, so clearly, okay, let's see how we factor this out. Um, I think what we do is we have a notion of a statement block. All right, let's see. So a statement block. Um, well, we're not hitting EOF, and we haven't seen the last one. Consume another one, and then finally consume the final thing. So in this case, we should be able to just do this. Um, All right, let's just, this still works. Uh, now, all expressions, the statements must have Let me just put in return statements while I'm at it here. Yeah, should make a macro for that crap. It's getting disgusting. I'll tolerate it for a while longer. Um, all right, so we also need to do the token detection.
All right. This works. Oh, I haven't added these. So current token Oh, I see. It's because I forgot to consume All right, so I think this parses, and then we just have to make sure it still gives 46. Yep, so that's right. <laughs> and um, all right, let's do ifs. So I guess let's do the bytecode size side of things first. So jump and branch of zero. Um, this is going to be a relative offset. And so yeah, let me just make sure that makes sense. So we read the next byte from the instruction stream and we unconditionally add that as a signed integer to this. So this is a one byte offset. Let's make this bigger. So we can do arbitrary offsets. Now for this one, um, branch of zero, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this, and if it's zero, uh, if it's zero, And we do the same thing here. But otherwise, we have to just step it forward by four. 
So if we take the branch, then we just add it. Otherwise, we have to step past the offset. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Now, if we do if first, um, the trick is that We need to save or we emit a dummy offset. So the the problem is we need to basically jump past the if block if uh, the condition is false. Um, but we won't don't know how far to jump until we've compiled the block. And so we do a standard thing called backpatching, where you reserve a slot in the instruction stream and save a pointer to that so you can backpatch it afterwards. Um, so this is what we're doing here. And um, then compile, not just, I guess not just the expression, actually that's not true, it should be like this. Oops. You first compile the condition, so you do this before the statement block, and then after the statement block, um, you have to fix up the offset, offset by this, which is further ahead, minus offset. But we have to treat this as a chart pointer. Actually, let me just stored like this. So let's see if we can get that to work. We haven't tested the parsing of the if, so I'm going to step through that as well. Okay. It didn't fail. Gets a good sign. Um, so yeah, the first one is just an expression. Wait. Oh, right. I need to use this. So that's the expression. This should be the if. So we have, how far in the code stream are we? Um, so let's see what this offset is. Oh, it's out of scope. All right, well, it seems to parse at least. <laughs> okay, this actually works. It's ridiculous. Just to make sure it's not accidentally being left on the stack, let's set two here. It should be three. Yep. So now if we change this to 
one. We should get four. And we do. Magic. Um, all right. So this was really easy. Um, let's do else as well. So after a statement block, we now look for an else, which we haven't declared. Okay, I'm actually going to All right, um, so what do we have here? Lost my train of thought. What was I doing? I, okay, else, I was adding stuff for else. So I think what you want to do is you have, want to have a while loop for else f. Actually, let's do else first, just plain else. I guess we don't really need else if anyway, if it's a C-like language. Um, so if we have an else, then, so the thing that's interesting about else as opposed to just plain ifs is when you come to the end of the then block, you need to jump over. That's actually the reason, one of the reasons we need jump is to be able to jump over um, this block here. So let's see. So this is the offset for jumping over. Let's call it the then offset. Um, let's call this the the else offset. And um, we have a statement block. And then we're at the end. Um, this is sort of the same deal where um, the distance from where we currently are to where we recorded that Um, okay. 
Okay, now I'm just tying my head in a little bit of a knot. Let me just clarify that I'm not doing this wrong. So this is how far we want to jump over. So this should be done here. No, should be done here. No, <laughs> here. Um, and if there's no else, then we just do it like this. Is that right? Let me just trace through the two cases. So suppose there's no else. So we record the offset. Uh, we get to the end of the statement block. And then this is the skip offset. Yep. Uh, if there is an else, then when we get to the end of the then block, we need to do an unconditional jump past the else block. So that's what we're doing sitting up here. After that, we need to set this target, yep, then do this, then, okay, I think that looks right. Oh, uh, yeah, someone points out that unless we have um, sort of single statement uh, blocks, we actually do need else if, so maybe we'll do that, yeah. Uh, let me let me just do this though to test first. The else if should be pretty easy. All right. Um, first, let's verify that we didn't break the existing code. Okay, that works. Um, and let me test actually both directions since there is a difference. Three. All right, so let's try doing this. Um, so now we should never get the value of one. Oh, I see. Um, token return. I need to do ones for else. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do this. Okay, so that works. So we just need a keywords table.
Oh, I see. Keyword F. Oh, right. Um, dope. Uh, identifier. What's that error? And F is not a member. Oh. There are too many things called token here. These are clearly not set up correctly. And that's also total garbage. <clears throat> All right, num keywords plus plus. Why is it skipping over that? That is bizarre. Okay, that's a typo. Keep hitting the wrong stepping key.
That makes no like sense. But... So it's zero. Now it's one thirty two, one thirty three, one thirty four. I'm an idiot. Yeah. Starting to get tired, apparently. Some of these stupid mistakes. Alright, let's look at this keywords array. Um, all right, all these bindings look reasonable. So this is the binding for X. Um, which should be an identifier. Here comes if. No token is if. So it's just trying to do stuff in that block. And oh, it didn't consume the else. How does that ever work? Bizarre. Oh, I guess it didn't. We just added else. All right. Okay, so let's see what this code did. Since we now have else, this setting should be shadowed by either branch, and so it should say x equals three, and so we should get five, right? Oops. Yep, we got five. Let's try one. So that works. Let's try doing else if. Um, so I think for else if we want a while loop. Oh yeah, this is a little bit interesting. So suppose we have some code here, if a, or if e1, s1, else if, e2, s2, uh, else, s3. 
so if this is zero, it will jump to checking E2. If this is zero, it will jump to checking E3 and, all, and so on all the way here. Um, but any one of these branches wants to jump all the way to the end once they're done, which is right past the final else. Right, so at the end of, you know, you can think of it this way, right? There's an implicit go to end with an end label here. So what makes this tricky is that there's actually an unbounded number of else ifs. Um, okay, I know the trick here. I know the trick. This is so we earlier we did the easy backpatching, and I'm going to show you the fancy backpatching tricks of your. Um, so yeah, we basically need a list of all these locations. So right now we have um, let's see. Right now we have what we call the else offset. We essentially need this, but a, a linked list of these, um, so that once we know the final end of the block, we can go through all of these go to ends from the chain and fix them up. Um, and the way we're going to do that is rather than we're going to encode dummy numbers in here that correspond to the offset of the previous uh, one before it. Hmm. So how are we going to do that? We are going to um, we are going to evaluate the condition to a branch of zero. Um, this should be the next offset. All right, so this jumps here where we now check this token. Um, and then we update this to be the current location and emit dummy. so that the previous will jump there when it fails its test. And then statement block. Let's see here.
So this logic here will take the last block before the else and have it skip all the way to the end of the whole chain. Um, so I think what we're going to do This is a little bit head hurting. Normally I would be able to do this, but that's what you get for doing these streams late at night. Um, so yeah, so, so we want to like remember the location. Remember, um, link this location, back patching later. In theory, this is the same thing. All right. Um, so we need the head of the linked list. which I guess is this one. These then I need some better names for these to keep my head straight. Um, this is the back patching offset. No, this is like um, let's call this the skip offset or. Uh, What's the right name for this? Hmm. Yeah, maybe this. Next alternative offset. So the, the next alternative could be the next else if, if there is one. Um, Okay. And then this other one will be like skip offset or something.
Hmm. I'm going to go get a drink just one second, guys. All right, Let's see if I can get my head straight. I should really draw a diagram, which you guys can't see. I'll get some paper here. All right, I think I sorted myself out a little bit. Um, so we're going to have a chain, which Right, I guess there's two cases. Um, we we'll just have to make sure to set end offset in either. So here, um, This is the offset to the previous end offset. I think that's right. So
All right, I guess this is the part that's tricky. What are you storing and what are you emitting? I think what you are emitting is the difference between emit pointer. Let's figure this out. What you're emitting is the difference between where we are and where the end offset was. And so now in the code stream, we can recover that. And so if we Let's see. The fact that the reason I have to do this with offsets rather than storing pointers directly in the stream is because this could be a 64-bit platform, and so the memory addresses, even though they're just temporarily in the stream, couldn't necessarily fit, which makes this way more awkward than it should be. <clears throat> Okay, so what do you emit in the stream is something that you can use to add. Okay. There's no way this works, but I, I think I need some code just to step through so I can sort my head out. Uh, and, and let's start with 
Um, let's make some examples here to test. Let's make one first without anything except just a plain else. Like I'm certain that code has bugs. I just want something to look at here. Why did it go into the source code mode? That is a mystery. All right, so I think that works. That's before. Yep. This one's going to be more interesting. Okay, so the linked list aspect of it seems to work miraculously. So now if we have zero, we should get five. What the fuck did that work? All right, let's extend. Okay, so I didn't consume. No, I did consume. Else if. So where in the stream are we about to parse the expression? Current token is also as expected. 
Now past that is looking at the condition. Okay, that's the problem. So that was four, which corresponds to the then branch. The good news is that meant it jumped all the way past this variable amount of stuff. But let's try this. Now we should get five. Now we should get six. Jesus, how the fuck did I write that complicated mess correct on the first time? All right. Just going to take a uh, celebratory swig for writing code that I'm not even sure I understand, and it just worked. I mean, I understand the principle of it. But having to deal with all the relative offsets and stuff makes it uh, pretty hard to keep straight. I definitely need to clean up this code at some point. Okay, so this is, I understand this part. This is just a linked list traversal. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think I just need better names for these things. And also, if some of the, if the absolute pointer stuff is separated from the relative calculations, this would be pretty straightforward. That's really the only thing that makes it complicated. But yeah, the idea is that you take all the sort of go to end uh, type things, unconditional jumps at the end of the uh, blocks and you chain them together and you embed that in the code stream so that you don't need a st you don't need a stack of locations to visit but uh they're just embedded in the code stream i mean honestly you could do something like just say hey you can only ever have uh 128 else ifs and then you just have a, a small stack on your call stack and you know manage it like an array and that would be simpler for sure but uh you know this is this is how people used to do it and probably how people still do it and it is kind of neat that you can kind of steal the storage from the temporary locations on the in the code stream so all right and by the way uh the reason you don't normally see this in for example a c parser is that they don't have else if they only have if and else and if you have only have if and else then the call stack effectively keeps the all these locations right so you don't need to deal with it because uh, if else if s if, else if is just an if within an else right so it just sort of works out but uh but yeah so all right <clears throat> let's do while while we're in back patching mode while should be much simpler um so with while we uh want to skip um Well, I guess there's different ways we can do it. Let's do it the simplest way, even though it's not the most efficient. Um, so we have to store off, I guess, the loop offset, which is like, you jump back here at the end of every loop. And let's call this the done offset. I guess they're not really the same thing. Yeah, okay, let's 
do it like this. Um, after the statement block, we do an unconditional jump. Uh, we do an unconditional jump back up to here. And then after this, this done offset has to be here. Is that right? So this is the very, no, that's not right. This should be here. Um, so every time through the loop, we evaluate the expression, we check if the expression is zero, and if it is, then we jump to the end. Otherwise, we evaluate the body, and at the end of the body, we jump back up to the um, to the top of the loop. So that looks correct to me. No, this has to be minus done offset. Since everything is relative. All right. Um, so let's do some very simple tests. Um, This is one. Um, I guess let's do uh, exponentiation. While n is non zero, let's say this is three. Um, so we're going to decrement x, or n is going to decrement, and we're going to multiply this by 2. Hmm, <laughs> that worked. All right, so if you, if you guys see that, that evaluated to 8, which is what you expect. So yeah, while is a lot easier. Um, good. I'm getting pretty tired. I have 50 minutes until midnight. I think I want to do functions. No, functions requires a little bit more. Let's do functions without... Let's see. What do you need for functions to be interesting? I guess I need local variables, not, not, not just globals. I could do functions without local variables, which is, <laughs> you know, that's how people used back in the assembly language days. Uh, functions were normally not used with arguments. Quite commonly, uh, they were not reentrant, and everything happened through global variables. So I guess we can do that just as a starting point, so that we need at least a, a stack for the program counters, but um, we can still use. I guess we can use maybe, yeah, we, we can probably use different frames. Uh, yeah, let's just do no local variables. Or, uh, so shared frame, I guess, is another way of putting it. Um, uh, I think I want to do it properly. I can't really do it properly in, in the time I have left before I have to go to bed. Okay, maybe this is where we stopped for the night. So uh, anyway, someone's asking about misaligned reads. No, you're right. This will totally result in misaligned reads. Um, uh, 
like misaligned reads i mean yeah no you're right misaligned reads are definitely possible in this format um and indeed i mean like any pretty much any variable variable length instruction format is likely to have issues with misalignment um of this sort if you have any unit that's not just a byte so there's different ways you can deal with that for now i'll just leave them misaligned but yeah um there's there's different ways you can handle that one of the, one of them is to have constant tables that are indexed by bytes so for example you could have a branch offset table that is indexed by a byte and that branch offset table would contain the different offsets that you're uh, referring to in the stream that has an extra level of interaction but now you're only doing uh aligned reads in your bytecode vm Um, yeah, I think I'll stop for the day. So we managed to do quite some good stuff here, I think. Uh, Josh is asking why it would be an issue for bytecode. I mean, keep in mind that there are processors that either straight up will throw like a hardware interrupt or not a hardware interrupt technically like an exception if you do a misaligned read so i try to read a four byte quantity um like look at my uh all my branch instructions like here ip is stepped typically at a one byte granularity but here i'm reading a four byte generally misaligned quantity and um on some on some platforms like i think mips and some of the older ones this is straight up illegal, and sometimes it's emulated in software by the operating system. Um, but it's definitely extremely slow and not something you ever want to do in practice. Uh, on x86, it's fast as long as it doesn't, you know, if you cross cache lines or especially pages and stuff like that, then it gets much slower. But in general, misaligned reads on x86 are not really penalized uh, as long as everything is in cache. All right. I think that's all for me for now. So uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully this was fun to see. I think there is a little bit of. I mean, I, I covered some of this stuff in a different form in my original compiler stream, but I think this was way higher tempo and um, because I wasn't bothering to do x64 code emission or anything. So this is a little more more of a pure demonstration of how to get this sort of stuff stood up. So yeah, thanks for hanging around. Um, I'll stay around the chat for a while if people have questions, but. Uh, Otherwise, I'm going to turn off the stream now.